Okay, and and that's all. Thank you. No, pero apaga las cámaras. Welcome to everybody um, to this urban resilience in the context of climate change conference. Um, now in this session with several presentations and further discussion on the topic climate resilience and community engagement. I am Maya Celaya Alvarez. Um, um, currently I coordinate the technical side of the city resilience profiling program from UN Habitat and I am also um, um, Horizon 2020 and Urban Innovative Actions Expert as for European projects. Uh, we will have several presenters today, six. Chiara Farinea, that is the head of European projects of Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia in the Advanced Architecture Group and teacher for Advanced Architecture. Mariana Fiusa, Mariana that has a master's degree in urban management and development from Erasmus University Rotterdam. Back uh, in her hometown, she joined the municipality of Teresina in Brazil uh, to collaborate with the Teresina 2030 strategy in order to promote innovation towards a more sustainable development. Muji Lestari, who lives in Bogor, Indonesia, and is experiencing the community-based environment program related to city resiliency. Mariana Marmelada, <clears throat> who is currently developing his, her master thesis in architecture at the University of Lisbon after an exchange period at the University of Tokyo, Japan, where she started her research in post-disaster recovery and resilience under the Urban Redesign Studies Unit. Lorenzo Mengali, um, that has a pluriannual experience in technical monitoring of EU funded projects for the LIFE program and that uh, he was recently appointed as leader of the LIFE Urban Hub, focusing on the analysis of policy impacts and best practices of climate and environmental projects under the LIFE program. And finally, Marcia Torres, uh, who is a Juan de la Firba Research Fellow of the Laboratory of Urban Transformation and Global Change at WOC University. She is an anthropologist and environmental scientist holding a PhD in environmental studies and her main research interests are water, climate adaptation and resilience, and inclusive governance. So as um, we want to be very, very brief with these presentations to go um, to the presenters, I, um, I leave the floor to Chiara. Chiara, the floor is yours. Thanks, Amaya, for introducing me. I'm Chiara Farinea, I'm the head of European projects at IAC, and today I'm going to speak uh, about the Urban Art project. I, I, can't, I can't share my screen, please, from the technical service. Um, still not. Uh, in any case, I will start to, to explain you something about the project. Uh, that's an Horizon 2020 co-funded project, uh, which aim is to regenerate the private areas in some cities throughout Europe uh, through the implementation of nature-based solutions. We are going to implement healthy corridors. Uh, and in, the, in these healthy corridors, are going to, we are going to implement nature-based solutions that will be co-designed with the citizens that are part of this uh, of this project. I, I still cannot share my screen and my presentation. I, I will continue to explain you about the project. Um, so this project. Uh, mm, 
First of all, is going to implement several nature-based solutions. We have 22 partners in the project and we have a catalog of nature-based solutions. These nature-based solutions are divided in three different typologies of nature-based solutions. There are the technological nature-based solutions that are mainly uh, developed by the institute where I work, that is the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, and they are developed through uh, digital fabrication techniques. Then we have territorial solutions that are a bit, um, a bit more traditional solutions, let's say, um, traditional nature-based solutions in the sense that are uh, like fetal depuration systems or this kind of systems. Then we have um, uh, ne social nature-based solutions that are a, a list of participatory uh, systems and uh, uh, games. For example, uh, at IAC we are going to implement the Super Mario video game. And we have also um, social economy solutions, like for example, uh, markets uh, and solidarity markets. Um, I'm, oh, now I can share my screen, fantastic. So um, I'm going to show you some of our nature-based solutions, technological nature-based solutions that we are going to implement in these healthy corridors. One of those is the growth tile, uh, which is a, um, a solution that is targeted at food and energy production, water saving, flood mitigation, and oxygen production. So there is a certain component uh, of uh, resilience uh, and uh, adaptation. Uh, in this case, we have a tile where we have a, a part that is drawn through parametric programs, which is bringing the water to the plants that are planted in the soil that is part of this box. In the box, we have a system that is um, uh, composed by a nanode the cathode that is a biophotovoltaic system that is harvesting the energy that is produced by the bacteria that are living near to the roots of the plants. So with this system, we are trying uh, through technologies to provide uh, the more ecosystem services as we can with uh, uh, and through nature-based solutions. So here there are some drawings. Uh, we implemented also sensors uh, in order to know, and we have an app in order to know how, uh, if there is enough irrigation or if we need, for example, extra water. Uh, we always test uh, our solution making prototypes. And here you can see the image of a prototype. And here you can see the image uh, of a possible implementation of the solution. Um, a very similar solution is the 3D printed green wall. It's very similar in the sense that it works on the same ecosystem services, food and energy production, flood mitigation, and oxygen production. But in this case, we have a system that is vertical. So there is a series of elements that are 3D printed. Uh, it is uh, based on a research on large scale 3D printing that we develop at IAC. Uh, here you can see some images and here you can see the final result of the solution that can be implemented. So uh, another of our solutions is the mushroom farm. In this case, we are cultivating uh, mushrooms and we are also producing some uh, tiles uh, for, um, for uh, uh, acoustic isolation within the system, in the sense that we have a system where we have um, a sort of substrate, uh, mycelium. The mycelium is creating uh, bricks or tiles inside the system and is also uh, creating some food or the mushroom in this case. Once the mushrooms are grown, we can cut them, open the tile and take out our panel, insulation panel, and start again with the process. Uh, here you can see we started the, the development of the system with our students. I will not go into detail as we don't have that much time. And we, were, we have also scaled up the system through our prototype. And here you can see a two meters high uh, system for mushroom cultivation in urban environment. Now I will go to the last project that I'm going to present here still. I will avoid some more products. And I will go to, the, to our system for co-design. We develop a video game for co-design. This video game is called Super Barrio. Here on the left side, we have uh, some 3D uh, of some elements. Those 
those elements, like for example, a tree can be uh, dragged in the 3D of the area. And uh, once the user drags each element, here there are some indicators that are changing in order to allow the user to visualize which is the impact of the solution. This system has been developed further for the, for the Urbinat project. We develop a catalog with the catalog of solutions that are the solutions of the Urbinat project. And we are implementing it in the cities of Nantes, of Sofia, and of Porto. We already used it in Nantes. Uh, here you can see the super value for Nantes. For each of the solutions, there, there is like the values uh, for each indicator. And here the sum of the values for each indicator once the, um, the user drag it uh, in the in the system. Here you can see the 3D of the NAND area and uh, all our uh, like categories of solutions. Clicking on each category, all the solutions will appear and it will be possible to drag them into the system. Uh, the system has been used uh, in uh, the living labs uh, in uh, NAND. Uh, we had several users and through the system uh, it's possible and now we are organizing the statistics of the solutions that has been the most chosen in order to understand for the citizens which are the most valuable solutions that they would like to implement. So I will cl close my, uh, my brief lecture, leaving you with a, a question that is, can we build the cities of the future basing them on nature-based dynamics? Thanks a lot for hearing me. Uh, wow. wow, really it's a pity not having more time to, to listen to this kind of, of uh, really incredible projects of, uh, based on high technical um, possibilities for the cities. Uh, let's see if uh, after all the presentations we have time to discuss about your question. Uh, I will leave the floor um, now to um, Muji. Um, Lestari, that uh, is going to talk uh, to talk to us about an example about how to reduce waste and so at source through community engagement in Bogor Regency, Indonesia. And the floor is yours, Muji. Okay, thank you, Amaya. Uh, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is my my name is Muji Lestari. I'm from. Uh, Bogor, Indonesia. I'm working for the local government of Bogor. And in this session, I would like to share our work in the waste reducing uh, program uh, through the community engagement. So, uh, uh, Bogor is quite a big regency. Uh, we have 5.0 million people. We have quite huge area. We have 40 districts, and uh, the city produces about 2,018 tons of waste per day. Uh, while on the other hand, we have only 156 units of trucks, so the surface coverage is only 19.1 percent. So we can imagine uh, the rest of the waste um, will be quite damage to the environment and uh, harmful for the health of the people. So uh, within this condition, so we try to make some program to uh, engage the community, uh, engage the community to uh, participate in the waste management. Uh, so we make environmental friendly village program or eco village. So uh, is a community empowerment program uh, for environmental movement in a neighborhood level. So um, this is including the environment education division, which in, include the workshops, and we send facilitators in its districts uh, to give education about waste, about greenings, water and sanitation, and the conservation. Um, and at the other end, at the end of the year, we make an assessment to uh, see how the community uh, has has been done in their uh, neighborhood level, and we make awarding. So this is uh, 
actually the great point of uh, people they like to be uh, appreciated by the local government so uh, they would like to do many things so uh, uh, so far it's quite they we have a very good attention from the people so this is uh, the program for the waste reducing for organic waste, we do two uh, types in community level and individual level. In community level, we do a composting box and we also uh, endorse black soil deer fly system. Uh, and for the individual level, uh, we, uh, we educate about the composting box and biopoly. This is the community level. So each neighborhood make like a big uh, hole or box to put their uh, organic waste inside. Uh, it can be for 10 to 20 households. So make they make it in uh, some areas within uh, and uh, they do it without any uh, any any funding from government. So they really do it within themselves. And this is for the household level. So in the community of uh, Eco Village, uh, they, after the education and motivation, they uh, try to make a compost box uh, in each household. So uh, every organic waste is uh, finished in their own house in their own house or within their own uh, composter, uh, like in this uh, picture. And there is also uh, the other kind of uh, organic waste treatment. This is maggot black soldier fly or BSF. Uh, if the composter only produce compost, but in this, uh, uh, in this system, it also produce a maggot uh, that uh, the people can sell it or they can also use it for the animal feeds or for the fish feeds. Yeah. Uh, and for the unorganic waste, uh, which is about uh, two, two, 20 to 30 percent of uh, whole waste. Uh, we we uh, make waste bank system, waste bank waste bank system recycling crafts. We have facilitators who teach the communities how to make uh, crafts from the recycled materials and also the plastic diet. This is a waste bank system. The waste bank system uh, is uh, a social and a social movement. So. Uh, the the people uh, has no salary because this is a social movement. So it is uh, managed by the focal point of the neighborhood within about twenty to one thousand members, and uh, they they do uh, motivate the neighborhood to separate their waste into two parts: organics and unorganics. So the unorganics waste can they bring from households to the uh, waste bank uh, that um, they have. And uh, usually they make it uh, like once in a week or once in a two weeks. So they make a weighing and registration. And then after the day of a weighing, they can sell it to the collectors. And uh, in Bogor Agency, we have Central Waste Bank it is uh, managed by the government, so uh, we have transport. Uh, we have transportation system, so we pick uh, the organic waste from the waste banks uh, communities. Uh, this is uh, also recycling crafts uh, because there is assessments, so the people like. Uh, so uh, get motivated to do or to make some innovations, how to make recycling crafts from any recycling materials. And this is, um, I can show you one of uh, 
uh, the pots, it is from the used diapers. Uh, and that is also the cans, echo breaks, uh, and also from the paper folds, it can be made uh, to plates and other materials. So uh, from this, uh, this has been, uh, this had been started from 2017. Uh, it was started from about 40 communities at the, at the beginning in 2017. But now in 20, 2020, it's becoming five, 450 communities in all around Bogor Agency. So this is such as no bullying actually. So it really um, this, uh, describes that actually the people are going to uh, more aware to their environment if we want to uh, if we want to educate them and we want to appreciate the people to do it so uh, it can be um, seen here that actually uh, the community engagement is something that can be uh, uh, important in a developing country to give solution for the waste management. Um, and number of waste banks up to uh, this uh, year is uh, already been for about 400 units. Within this project, within this program, we have already uh, can reduced about 70% of the local waste uh, produced in the neighborhoods of the communities. Uh, so we, ha we hope that it's um, going snowballing, that uh, every neighborhood will um, uh, like to do it because uh, they, uh, the, the, this, uh, this will be a benefit to them because we have a very limited transportation system within this uh, movement. Uh, we, they don't, they have resiliency in waste management. So connected to urban resilience, the community is more resilient in the uh, waste management that don't, they don't really uh, depend again to the transportation system. So uh, maybe this is uh, what uh, I can share about this. Thank you very much. Sorry, um, I had not the, the audio. Um, I was telling that uh, many, many thanks to Muji for the great presentation uh, that shows how um, raising awareness, commitment leads to action. So how you can work with the three, with the three R's, reduce, uh, reuse and recycle. In this case, the reduction um, comes to 70% of the, of the waste at source, which is a big, big achievement. So, okay, it's really great. Uh, I will pass now the floor to, to Mariana Marmelada. Yes, that hi. We'll talk about post-disaster post situations, so another angle of, of oral resilience that include affected communities in the design process and acceptance of, uh, of, of, the, of the suffering resulting in a stronger community uh, bonds. Let's, uh, the floor is yours, Mariana. Thank you. Um, yes, so the project was developed specifically while in Japan, while I was in exchange period. And it was a group project where we actually went to Tenno, which is in Hiroshima prefecture. And it was affected by the July's heavy rain disaster in 2018. Um, it was the most affected region of this disaster uh, in this specific town, which has uh, 4,500 inhabitants, uh, 12 people died, resulted from uh, five landslides that converged on this town. 
So we, the purpose of, of the University of Tokyo collaboration with the, with the local government was for us to develop a proposal project uh, for this uh, town and show it uh, to the, the government. So unfortunately, we didn't have a direct connection with the community as a whole. We did have a, con a conversation um, with the local leaders, which helped us to direct as what was needed in the town specifically. Um, so far, I'm not able to share. Oh, yes, I am, sorry. Okay, so as I explained, um, well, this is in Tokyo, Hiroshima, and then Kure uh, Tenno is the relationship. So this was the, the result of the disaster, major uh, landslides and um, debris flows. And so, this is the, the location of the most uh, disaster areas where the, so the gray area is, everything was flooded with debris. And just a quick look of the destruction about the, the buildings. And in this picture, as we can see, most of the areas that were affected are actually on places that are indicated as hazard areas uh, by the government. So what we discovered was that most of the valley was already occupied by houses that didn't had, uh, I mean, no one was using the houses, so the houses were empty, which makes the population have to continue to build on, on onto the hills, where is the disaster area uh, marked. Um, so these are the main uh, distributions. Uh, so with two train stations, uh, and the pier, but that's so. This was the result of our uh, our meeting with the local leaders. Mainly, they said that they, they wanted to have a memorial park for the for the disaster, the main disaster area, and they would like to have a better connection with the river and to have um, to bring nature back to the town, since the, the whole town has been um, heavily. Um, sorry, uh, heavily um, transformed with uh, gray infrastructures. So these were pictures of how the town was before with many, like the river was green and everything. So this is mainly our proposal. We divided it in three scenarios. Um, the red is just what the government has already planned. So we, did, we did, couldn't move any of this. So mainly the, the government's proposal are all engineered solutions with uh, sabo checked uh, dams, which are sedimentary dams to trap sediments when the uh, landslide occurs. And so we mainly did the, the proposals about the river itself. So as you can see in these sections, the river is all channelized and all in, in concrete embankments and right next to the roads. So there's no permeability of the river and the river has been straightened into the town. So our proposal is to reconvert the, the river embankments to more natural solutions. And so the permeability of the river improves. Uh, we decided to redesign the river and make it more natural and more, more, more so and proposed here a natural uh, park for the, for the community, uh, especially in the areas by destroying the houses that were completely destroyed and uh, demolishing them and then converting this area into, um, into the park. Since most of the areas that have been, most of the houses that have been destroyed, the, their lots are being converted into parking lots. So it's again impermeable and there's no actual use for the place. So this was just a proposal. And another one was to develop a market underneath a highway that we have in the place. There it's a completely a, um, a brown field, which is not being used. And as we can see, we have a lot of area uh, agriculture area that has been uh, abandoned. So most people, uh, about 10 years ago, there were 10 farmers who weekly participated in the, in the farmer's market. Right now they are four. So in 10 years, they drank a lot. And just of those four, two of them are active farmers. The other ones just do it as a hobby. So the, the farmer's market actually doesn't work that well. It's now it's twice a week and there's not many people actually advocating it. Um, so this is the brownfield that I was talking about and the only use that it has right now is for a children's uh, playground. 
so our proposal was underneath the, the highway to bring more uses and specifically a, a market, which instead of, of being a whole building, just fragmenting and having it as a small uh, individual um, booths, which every citizen could be um, selling uh, their crafts or their purchase or whatever their uh, produces everything that they would like so and to increase uh, the community's engagement um, and regarding housing uh, we proposed two sites uh, one of them was um, a kindergarten which we re repurposed as a um, Sorry, this is because of the time, I think it's not necessary. So we repurpose and specifically one of the scenarios, there's a solution by the Japanese government where um, poor housing or in poor conditions, all of the, the neighborhood can be destroyed and repurpose and have a new improvement for the neighborhood. So this is the proposal that we do for the government. And Ten, uh, the government itself, so we did the presentation actually one day before the first community workshop. So we had since uh, October uh, 2018 until January 2019, we did our proposal. And then on the 19th of January, we proposed and made our presentation to the to Kure and Tenos community, um, local government. And on the next day, uh, the community, the sorry, the local government actually started a community workshop with the population. And so it was divided in five sessions. And here we can see the first session, which I was present at. And basically the, the, the community was divided in six groups. Each group had to specify with different post-its of colors, um, how did they evacuate, which damages did they suffer, and what was their proposals for uh, reconstruction of the, the city. So from this first session, the government took their, their suggestions and played out uh, a plan. And then the other um, following sessions are just meetings with the, with the community to assert which uh, areas they wanted to improve and if they all agreed with the situation. So basically, this is the plan that the community revealed. They wanted to have uh, the, so the check dams, uh, so the, um, the sediment, uh, sedimentary dams being installed, specifically five of them on the whole town. And they wanted to have a memorial park at the same way that the, the local um, leaders had told us previously. And they wanted uh, to have a roads improvement because since this is a small town, most of the roads are just one lane and there's quite a few traffic and it's difficult for people to evacuate. So they wanted to widen the roads. And at the same time, one of the areas that was targeted with one of the landslides was the, the town's junior high school. So they, there's uh, an elementary school and a junior high school. So they wanted to both merge the two of them and move the, the junior high school into the elementary grounds and have a whole school rebuilt. This was actually one of the things that we proposed to in our project. Um, and basically one of the things that they made really said was that they wanted to widen the river, the river banks, and especially dig the riverbed. So for the river itself to be more, um, to have better beverage of the water and the sediments in case of an, another um, disaster. And basically the, the government's proposal is the same. I apologize for being in Japanese. I still didn't, weren't, wasn't able to specifically translate this map, but the whole other part uh, I was able to. And, and uh, so basically what we can see is that they adopted most of the population's um, insights, but the, our proposal, which had natural uh, based solutions and were more specifically targeted to improve the community engagement and, uh, and their sense of belonging into the town was a bit, um, wasn't actually uh, incorporated into this program. So as you can see, most of the solutions that the, the government is doing are all gray uh, infrastructures. And one of the things that they wanted was to have a um, community disaster resilient, um, sorry, community disaster public uh, housing, which is in an area that it's completely barren. So it doesn't bring a lot of, um, 
community. So it's separated from the whole area of the town. So this was one of the things that we actually understood that didn't actually benefit anyone. Uh, since our view was that uh, victims of the disaster event often developed uh, post, um, uh, post-traumatic stress and other psychological disorders. So they usually fade with time, uh, but people, the victims who move out of the town um, end, end up uh, suffering from more stress factors than others who stay in the, in the affected area. So especially due to isolation, lack of emotional support, and um, alienation by the new communities. So our intention was to integrate the community into the development of this project, uh, which we can see that at least the Japanese government is already uh, thinking of this and in actually consulting the community. Uh, we just uh, realized that maybe um, another, like a third party intervention would be beneficial for these communities to be able to have a better understanding of other possibilities and other solutions that are available to them, like uh, nature-based solutions. So Thanks, Mariana, for your presentation. It's, it's very honest that you propose not only the project itself, that is, of course, touching all this uh, climate adaptive infrastructure, uh, talking about water, even brownfield remediation or ecosystem services when it comes to agriculture, in even housing. But you have also show us what uh, is happening in reality now, and it's very, very honest. So I thank you for that. And now I have to, to give the floor to the next um, presenter, that is uh, Lorenzo, um, Lorenzo Mengali, that is going to talk uh, about uh, EU life funding uh, projects because he has a lot of experience in, in several success uh, stories. So Lorenzo, the floor is yours. Yep, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to show some uh, life projects uh, on urban resilience uh, in this event. Um, as you may know, uh, it's not going the ne to the next, uh, okay, okay. Uh, as you may know, the LIFE program uh, is uh, an European funding instrument for the environment and climate action uh, that started in 1992 and has uh, co-financed more than 5,400 projects having contributed so far with more than 6 billion euros to the protection uh, of the environment. Uh, the program has co-founded more than 150 projects on climate change, uh, even if uh, the strand uh, CCA was uh, only uh, uh, um, started uh, in 2014. And among these climate adaptation projects, uh, about one third are related to urban resilience, uh, dealing with uh, green and rural infrastructures, sustainable uh, urban drainage systems, uh, climate and energy action planning, improvement of urban biodiversity, better management of urban green areas, and so on. Uh, in the next slides, I will briefly present four successful closed uh, life projects dealing with urban resilience in different contexts. And for more details on these specific projects, since uh, I need to be very quick, uh, there is a link uh, to the website uh, uh, in the related slides. So, okay. Uh, the Life Sarah Suits uh, project tested the way to reuse uh, obsolete uh, ceramic tiles available in local stock for the production of permeable pavements. Uh, Low-cost ceramic tiles that are out of the market, uh, mostly older than 15 years, uh, were purchased from uh, local producers uh, and cut into slices uh, and glued together to build uh, a ceramic module uh, that uh, have gaps uh, uh, that allows uh, water to infiltrate. Uh, these modules were used uh, as top layer of a sustainable urban drainage system uh, installed in Benicassim uh, in Spain, a small city near Valencia. In this way, circular economy principles were also integrated in the project to reduce the impact uh, uh, of raw material consumption. The pilot consisted in a low traffic road with the pedestrian and bike lanes and surrounding green area. The pedestrian and bike lanes were redesigned with ceramic pavements uh, as top layer and gravel and sand layers below to allow water filtration. And uh, the bike lane uh, uh, under the bike lane also tanks collecting the water uh, infiltrated from above were uh, installed, allowing uh, its reuse to water the green area nearby. 
During the one-year validation, uh, uh, a total of 28 heavy rain events were registered for a total of about 1,000 cubic meter of rainfall. And of this, 86% uh, was correctly managed by the system, reducing uh, significantly the surface runoff uh, with a delayed runoff operation uh, time of about 45 uh, minutes. Part of the collected water was uh, filtrated and achieved uh, sufficient quality to be reused for green management. Uh, while the remaining part uh, uh, evaporated, lowering the surrounding temperature. A detailed uh, business case was also analyzed, showing that uh, the CERTSUD uh, system uh, has cost 30% higher than conventional concrete solution, mainly due to the fact that the ceramic module production process, process is not yet uh, fully industrialized. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the search system has better aesthetic properties, uh, improved safety with the reduced slippery of the pavement surface, and more importantly, a lower cost for the management of water runoff. Uh, the next project, uh, the Deris uh, project, uh, defined and tested an innovative public-private partnership model between insurers public administrations and small and medium uh, enterprises to increase urban resilience to climate change uh, while providing local businesses with uh, specific tools to reduce the related risks. The climate risk assessment and management uh, software developed by the project, uh, uh, which comprised seven risk maps uh, and 58 questions to be answered uh, uh, autonomously, uh, guides the company in the identification and assessment of the risks they face uh, due to climate change and helps them in the definition of suitable adaptation actions uh, so that detailed company adaptation plans uh, can, produce, can be produced. Uh, the 28, 28 companies uh, uh, were involved directly in the project uh, and developed uh, their plan and uh, a way more companies were also involved uh, through replication of project results. Uh, in total, the measure proposed concern um, operational and management procedures in about 40% of the cases uh, and interventions on infrastructures and in installation, some of which uh, are also green and blue infrastructures. And almost half of the targeted risk are related to floods and rainfall. Uh, also, an integrated district action plan for in Turin was also developed, taking into account the, the main findings of all the company plans and defining a more overarching goal, merging the needs and targets, uh, the targets of businesses and public administrations at district level uh, for the medium and long terms. Uh, after a long participatory process uh, involving uh, the insurance world, uh, the public authorities, banks, uh, trade associations, uh, and local companies. Uh, uh, a financial instrument was also developed, basically consisting uh, in facilitating uh, access to credit uh, with low interest rates for small and medium uh, enterprises adopting uh, the company adaptation action plans. Uh, the project also organized several workshops and working tables uh, at different levels, uh, uh, contributing to raising awareness on climate change adaptation and to defining new models of green financing uh, to address the issue. Several Italian cities outside the project were also involved in the application, uh, and each one signed a memorandum of understanding in which it commits uh, to the project goals. The third project uh, is Life uh, Green for Grey, uh, in this project, uh, a set of uh, multifunctional uh, green and blue infrastructure elements uh, were used for climate ad adaptation actions uh, in four small towns in Belgium and in some districts uh, of Brussels. Uh, the implemented measures included construction of ponds uh, and enlargement of water streams, uh, creation of wetlands to improve uh, water retention and flood resilience uh, of the area. Uh, there were also trees that were planted, trees bushes, local uh, uh, species of plants, uh, contributing to improvement uh, of habitats for birds, amphibians, uh, and uh, insects. Uh, and uh, some gray infrastructures in the pilot uh, were uh, partially replaced with green corridors uh, and reclaimed as green areas to be included in nearby city parks. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, a long participatory process involving the local community took place before the implementation of the measures 
And in some cases, part of the, these measures, measures were also directly implemented in private properties, for example, by planting uh, local flowers or using mowing practices that are more friendly to the local fauna or by creation of local orchards, uh, providing food and also providing shelter to insects and birds. Uh, local uh, small and big enterprises uh, were also involved uh, in the process uh, with example of green corridors and infrastructures uh, included in the adaptation plans uh, of those companies. And the project contributed also to the construction of recreational areas, uh, uh, walking and biking paths, paths. And uh, in some cases, uh, they also used light colored asphalts uh, to increase pavement reflectance uh, and then reduce uh, local temperature. Some of the measures were also designed uh, together with local uh, schools and universities uh, within workshops and instructional uh, events organized by the project. The local community was also engaged uh, through natural trips, uh, safaris, uh, explaining uh, the natural capital of the area and the measures uh, that can be taken by the citizens to protect it. And finally, the project uh, contributed also to the setup of the Green Deal for Companies and Biodiversity, which attracted uh, more than uh, 100 companies in Flanders, and uh, uh, which have which of each of them assigned uh, a deal. Uh, uh, promising to green uh, some uh, 1,200 hectares in total uh, of, in business terrains. And uh, the last one, uh, the <coughs> Life Sec Adapt, its main uh, objective was to contribute uh, to the implementation of the EU climate adapt adaptation strategy in, uh, involving 17 municipalities uh, from Italy and Croatia. Uh, climate change risk and vulnerability assessment tables uh, were produced for each municipality and for the two related macro areas, uh, the Marche region and the Istria region. Uh, the analysis included the eight risk categories uh, and the related indicators uh, to monitor the system status and the thresholds for each of the selected risks. Sustainable energy and climate adaptation, adaptation plans were also developed, uh, including about 20 measures on average on mitigation and adaptation and contributing uh, to the enrollment uh, of these cities uh, to the covenant uh, of Myers. Uh, a monitoring tool, uh, an open source uh, and web-based software uh, assessing the mitigation and adaptation measures uh, was also developed uh, and its function uh, to monitor the, the defined indicators uh, evaluate the achievement of the targets and produce reports for, for stakeholders and policymakers. Uh, it is structured to verify the compliance with the covenant of mayors for climate and energy requisites and uh, its potentiality were also uh, been highly appreciated by the covenant of mayor office. Uh, the cooperation uh, uh, of uh, the municipality involved uh, and uh, uh, of Marke region and Istria region constituted a uh, uh, best practice also in the framework uh, of the uh, Adriatic Ionian macro regional strategy, uh, since it contributed to territorially coherent implementation of the EU strategy uh, on adaptation to climate change and to the definition of the Croatian national uh, adaptation plan approved in uh, mid-2020. Uh, Thanks, Lorenzo, for these four interesting projects. Um, I, I think that they, ha they, they have covered several um, matters that, uh, that uh, have already been uh, reflected through the other presentations as uh, materials, ceramic tiles, um, <coughs> of course, um, Financial and, and and credits and everything that has to do with the with the economy development we we need uh, along with the um, with these uh, green and blue uh, solutions. I will I will select among uh, the four of them the one that uh, that uh, proposes the um, stakeholders engagement between insurance among insurers and. And, and public administrations and SMEs, because when we think in commitment, we are always thinking in citizens, but sometimes these kind of institutions also need uh, to be engaged. So thank you very much. I will give the floor now to uh, Marsa Torres, 
that uh, is going to um, to talk about the um, uh, comparison between Barcelona and Sevilla participatory analysis as for climate change and resilience. Mar, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Let me share the screen. Okay. I hope you see the presentation. So thank you very much, Amaya, for introducing me and the organizers of the conference for giving us the possibility after six months of, of being here together, sharing the thoughts and, and many reflections on urban resilience after, well, in, in the meantime of COVID. Today I'm presenting the results of the of some of the results of the project Recities. Um, the Recities project um, is funded by the Spanish Ministry of Science. Um, it addresses two different case studies in Barcelona and Seville, and it deals with institutional and grassroots initiatives um, addressing hydroclimatic risks. Particularly, we focus in three different hydroclimatic risks common in the in urban Mediterranean areas, such as floods, heatwaves, and droughts. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the aspects that we want to look with, we, we are looking with the Recities project, is the is how urban resilience planning is incorporating questions of social equity and particularly in this presentation we look up to the third component of, of justice which is procedural justice and which means how um, processes of, of urban resilience decision making are inclusive and participatory since there is a debate whether these processes have been uh, married this this kind of inclusive and participatory processes or there are failures to, empower, to empower social groups and marginalized groups so um, the question that we that we are addressing in, in this presentation is how and to what extent urban climate resilience planning involve different members of the public taking into account how um, uh, how they can influence the, the process, so the degree of public influence, which kind of members of the public are engaged, and also in which stages of the of the planning process. One of the novelties is that we are not just focusing on explicitly mentioned resilience plans, but on different urban planning strategies building resilience. So on the one hand, I will skip maybe this part of methods and since, since we don't have that much time, but on, on the one hand, we, we evaluated this public influence following this, this different scale that I will explain a little bit more later. And on the other hand, I, as I said, we want to understand who was involved, particularly dealing whether well, it was just the administration, that means the policymakers, the experts, or um, it, it and the processes were engaging the, pub, the public or um, specifically um, vulnerable and marginalized groups. This is the last category where we put public and inclusive. As I said, we focus on resilience strategies um, in, in the case of Barcelona, but also in climate planning instruments that uh, ultimately are building also re resilience to, to climate uh, risks. Also, we, uh, we, are, we analyzed water planning, um, emergency plans, and green plans. In the case of Seville, we don't have uh, specifically resilience strategies, but we analyze climate planning, um, water planning, green planning, and we also took into account um, strate um, strategic planning um, dealing with, uh, which also contributes to resilience. So let's go to the results. Um, yeah, I'm looking to the time. Uh, the red points and the different points here are showing the different plans we analyzed in the, in this case, this is the case of Barcelona, the different colors show us the different categories of plants. So for instance, the red colors are showing us the climate plans and how they are, um, and uh, sorry, and the axis, uh, uh, the uh, horizontal axis is showing us the level of co-design and the vertical axis is showing us the level of co-implementation. So for instance, here we can see how earliest climate plans in Barcelona show low levels of um, co-implementation and 
medium levels, such as consultation um, of co-design. While the latest, the, the, the la latest uh, climate plans in Barcelona, uh, particularly from the last five years, show high levels of both co-design and co-implementation. As I said, we did this analysis for different um, typologies of planning, such as resilience, green planning, water planning, emergency planning, and also for the case of Seville. Since we don't have that much time, I will go to the, to the summary of, of this analysis. Um, what we can see is from the different plans we took into account, we can see some that particularly climate and green plans are named, are, are co-planet. That means that both the design and the implementation um, involved the community um, in high degrees. So from consultation till um, co-decision in this case, because we couldn't find any example of delegated power. Um, we found also um, some of the plans that were not co-designed, so were not um, involving the community in the design stage, but were involving the community in the implementation stage. This is especially, especially important for resilience plans that we have um, till now in, in Barcelona. We know that right now um, the municipality is working towards the resilience strategy, but, but we have just two plans right now. Uh, and this, these are the plans that we evaluated. And for water planning in the case of Seville, um, the triangles in blue that, that you can see in, the, in your left. Uh, we also identified um, some plans that were uh, just in, um, consulting the people, uh, the, the community in the, in the design stage uh, with low levels in, in, the, in the bottom right. And finally, some of the plans were, we, we named them as, as top-down planning because they were or not, um, or using non-participatory forms of involving the community or um, just informing the community in the, in the implementation stage. This is the case of water planning in Barcelona and emergency planning in Barcelona, as well as the earliest climate plans in Seville. Okay. Um, as I said, the other analysis we did is with whom, so with which kind of stakeholders were this, this set of plans um, um, con, uh, built, designed, and, and implemented. Um, this graph is, is again showing us in the, in, the, in the vertical axis, in the horizontal axis, of, uh, sorry, the design and in the vertical axis, the implementation. But now the scale has changed towards which kind of stakeholders are involved. So um, what we can see is that resilience plans um, in, in yellow um, involved um, just experts, that is, for instance, by private companies or universities, professional, professional stakeholders. We saw that climate plans both in Barcelona and Seville involved um, organizations, professional and lay organizations, um, that some of the plans made the, the effort of not just involving organizations, but some also some citizens, so some lay citizens. And finally, some of the plans were not either involving um, each, each, of the each of these categories and just were produced with, with the policymakers and, and the administration. Um, this gives an idea of how the for the design is important to, in, these plans are relying very much on, on, on the knowledge and the experience of social organizations. And a surprising finding here, it was that some of the plans with low levels of of public influence were um, um, were, uh, were also involving some of the of, of vulnerable groups. For instance, in the case of heat waves plans or the drought plan in in Barcelona, they were targeting specifically vulnerable groups to inform them. So not uh, with high degrees of empowerment, so not with consultation or, or feedback, but at least um, they were targeting these these vulnerable groups. So this is why they are in this corner. Uh, as a conclusion. Um, um, what we have seen through this analysis is that 
co-planning of urban resilience is happening in, this two, in these two cities partially. Um, this analysis, we think that we, it can be extended in other cities in order to assess um, how this community engagement is occurring or not in, in urban resilience planning. We have captured different forms and degrees of, of public engagement. And, and as I said in the beginning, it's very important to take into account that, that different and, and diverse planning cultures building resilience. Um, in this sense, we have seen how the entry points for, for high levels of, of public influence and community engagement are basically climate and green policies building resilience. And, uh, less uh, open to the public, the, the policies less open to the public, which are also contributing and building resilience are water policies with some differences between both cities, um, resilience policies and emergent, emergency policies. And as I said, emergency policies do consider as vulnerable populations um, just in the implementation uh, phase for informing them. So we can learn something for targeting the, the vulnerable groups, but as I said, um, there are there is still um, um, things to be done to, to fully um, um, involve the community in, in these policies. Uh, Thanks, uh, yeah. we have to we have to leave it here. Perfect. Um, I I was looking to that time and yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I uh, this is a, it, I know it's a challenge, but we have six presenters and and one hour and a half. So I think I went to the conclusion. So fine. perfect. <laughs> yeah, I I give you thanks for your for your really great presentation. Um, I think I think from my side the 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 new matter that you bring to the table after uh, listening to all the other participants is the, the importance of policies, plans, and initiatives, and how they are or not uh, moving towards resilience. And of course, your, your final uh, conclusion about um, the work that is still needed to involve uh, people in vulnerable situations. So many thanks. I have to, to give the floor to Mariana uh, Fiuta from Teresina. Uh, she is going to to talk about uh, a, a project called, uh, called Women for Climate, uh, gender-based climate resilience public policy in Teresina, Brazil. Um, the floor is yours, Mariana. Thank you very much. The last one after all this great presentation, so it's a great responsibility. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so thank you, Amaya, for introducing me. My name is Mariana Fiuza. I am an urban planner at Teresina Agenda, Agenda Teresina 2030, that is a department of the municipality of Teresina. Well, it started recognizing we have a problem, a global problem. Climate change, climate change is happening now and is happening fast but it does not impact everyone equally. So the poorest part of the world's population suffered the most the multiplier effect of poverty on vulnerability, exposure, and adaptability of climate change. It turns out, it turns out that most of these people living in, living in extreme poverty in the world today are women. So how does this problem manifest in Teresina? So Teresina shines under the Equator sun. This is a quote from our anthem. So this is very precise. We are right under the Equator line. Indeed, maybe too much. This is a map from NASA showing the last 100 years, the climate change on the globe, the average of the of the change in the temperatures. And it uh, reveals a sad reality that our city is getting hotter at a rate that is twice higher than the global average. So in 1992, when I was born, Teresina had 281 days above 32 degrees Celsius. And by the time I'm eight, 
model shows that almost all days of the year will be very hot. So yeah, Teresina is very, very hot. And now I presented my city and I want to introduce you to someone. The first group of women we work we worked with uh, are the gardeners. They are mainly elderly women. They are working on the community gardens of Teresina, producing local food. And the main problem is that uh, because of the climate change and the change in the regime of rain, the raining and dry season is changing. And this is impacting the food production. So they have their earnings being under threat because of that. And also they are very exposed to the sun. So can you imagine to be in that heat all the time taking care of the of the food of the vegetables is a very tough um, profession the recyclers also are most elderly women and they cross the city carrying this metal car collecting recyclable waste throughout the city and they earn a very very small amount of money because of that so for one kilogram of plastic waste, they earn around 10 cents of uh, US dollars. So they have to be outside a lot of time and during the night is not safe for them to stay outside because of course they do it alone and they prefer to do this during the day, but because of the heat, because of the sun, most of them they have problems on their skin. The potters, they hold um, a tradition, traditional knowledge on this kind of uh, handcraft in Teresina, that is to use the clay to do uh, these beautiful pieces like plates and mugs and animals. And the problem is that the clay is not a renewable resource. So they are running out of clay and because of climate change, how the climate change is impacting the seasons, the rainy and the dry season is going to be harder for them to extract the clay from the river banks. So they also have a bigger problem like a threatening to their livelihoods. So Women for Climate in Teresina is located uh, in this interception between gender equality and climate change. But gender equality and climate change are somehow covered by traditional plans, policies, and initiatives. But this interception of them is not very, is not very known and is not very obvious and is also uh, gave us room for experimentation and innovation. And why was that innovative in our, our context? The reason one is because we overcame bureaucracy. So for that, we had to invite some international partners and to get international funding to promote uh, the first studies lab masterclass in the America. The studies lab masterclass is promoted by the University of Applied Science Fonds located in the Netherlands, and the program allows the host municipality to have a real case of its choice examined in one of these experiences. So we had the, the funding from the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Brazil, and we could overcome all this bureaucracy. You, you can imagine that the context in Brazil, the public sector in Brazil is very bureaucratic, and to have funding for an uh, innovative project like that would be very difficult without these international partners. So we could overcome this. The reason too is because of the methodology that we adopted. So the methodology of the master class itself, it uh, brings together a lot of different participants, such as students, professionals, and civil servants. So we got around 25 participants uh, from different backgrounds and expertise. So all these participants, they were invited to be engaged during six days of uh, field trips and uh, 
local experts, lectures, and to get to know the women and the work that they do. And that was one of the most important aspects of this uh, initiative is that we call it this methodology working us and not just with the women. So it means that we have lived the problems on the ground in practice and discuss short, medium and long term solutions. But the most important reason is because the women were active part of the process. So since the preparation and during throughout all the process, the women were listening. So they could share their challenge, their perspective, and also their uh, wisdom because they know a lot about the climate and how the climate is changing because they work with natural materials, they work outside, so they have a good perce per perception of how uh, the climate is changing in Teresina. So these are the pictures that we took during the, the workshop where the participants had the opportunity to make questions and the women were the protagonists all the time. So that was the reason the products that the, the groups developed uh, in, the uh, in the last day of this workshop after six days working with the design thinking methodology they could produce very good uh, products that uh, they are very, uh, they really are in touch with the reality of those women. So for the gardeners, they proposed to improve the infrastructure of the gardens, such as providing public lighting to make the women to feel safer during the, during the night. And this is the mayor of Teresina, <laughs> just to, for you to know. And uh, for instance, for the recyclers, they proposed to, re to, to renovate a building inside their neighborhood uh, to transform it in an echo point so the women could storage the recyclable waste in a place that is more comfortable for them in, and also to use electrical bi bikes to go throughout the neighborhood collecting the recyclable waste in a more comfortable way. And for the potters, the ceramists, they proposed to change what the, what the potters are selling from a product that are the clay pieces to an experience, like to experience the process of production of the, the the ceramics, so um, create uh, uh, an experience throughout the neighborhood, experience the, the traditional knowledge that they have. So this is the, the picture of the final presentation. Uh, all the women were there and they had the opportunity to see the proposals, like the final result of the, of the groups. And also the mayor was there, so they had the chance to talk with the mayor like directly and to, to show them that the, the, the initiative also is covering their needs. It's something that they were part, active part of it. So the lessons learned is that climate change is not gender neutral. And it is essential to localize the global and globalize the local to achieve 2030 agenda. And a wise and sustainable city is made of human relations. And what about the future? So last year in October, we had this amazing workshop and we had great proposals, but what about the future? The project for the gardeners was selected by Transformative Actions Program, TAPI, 2019 by clay for funding raising. So that was great that we have a project like that. And the project for the recyclers is under evaluation by the World Bank to be implemented next year, like the renovation of the echo point. And also the recyclers, they received uh, financial support from a uh, crowdfunded organized by the participants during the COVID crisis because they are the most vulnerable group and this is our team and I'm we are sorry, very thankful uh, we will have to leave it here because we need 10 minutes at least for questions uh, 
great presentation. Okay. <laughs> great presentation and Teresina and, and, and the team of the city always so active uh, in all the projects you are developing because this is not the only one I, I know. So many, many thanks. Uh, I have seen that in your conclusions that you are going to get more funding for more interesting and exciting projects. Um, I, I have loved this, this, this sentence about uh, not work with, me, with women, but work as women. So yeah, as a woman, I, I appreciate it. And, and now um, we are going to try um, in this um, last minute, minute some questions with the, with the panelists. I think we can be all with our video on. Um, uh, this will be the way of, of getting, yeah. So we have uh, we have been uh, gathering and getting several questions from from the audience to our participants. I will try to go at least for three. First is for Chiara, that uh, made very very short presentation, and uh, so uh, we need to know uh, what do you think about the feasibility of nature-based solutions in terms of cost of production, implementation, and of course, finance. Uh, with regards to the cost, it depends on how do you calculate it, in the sense that, uh, that nature-based solutions are bringing several um, impacts, let's say, on the city. We are, we are working on uh, pollution, but nature-based solutions are also Thinking, bringing other kind of values, as for example, uh, they are creating a space for for leisure. So it really depends on how do you consider, because there are costs that are like costs for the um, health, for the health system. So if we consider to plant a plant, yes, it's a cost. In public space, yes, it costs a plant. And then there is also a gardener, and then you have to take care of the diseases and all the rest. But how do you consider this in, in relation to the whole city? So it is bringing like good effects and other kind of savings on other, uh, other cost for the city. So uh, we have to, while implementing nature-based solution, it is necessary to, to see the city and all its uh, issues uh, as a wall. Otherwise, uh, of course, it can be considered just as a cost. Uh, it depends. Yeah. Then lands and nature-based solutions are also bringing like products. So also this is compensating the cost somehow. Yeah, so we will have to invent uh another way of measure certain things, right? Because uh, usually we, we have not sucked uh, yet in uh, environmental or social impact in, 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 in a way of, of really having this kind of tackling of the situation. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's not an easy question. Um, <laughs> grazie, <laughs> Chiara. I go for Lorenzo now. Um, audience is asking about the projects you presented. Uh, which of them had a stronger actions towards community engagement and awareness raising? Which of them? I didn't uh, understand. Which of them had stronger actions towards community engagement and awareness raising? Well, uh, it depends uh, because, uh, for example, in Derris, uh, local businesses uh, were involved, uh, while in the Green for Grey, uh, the residents uh, were involved uh, and. Uh, both in Green for Grey, there is, uh, but also in the Celsuits uh, and uh, SecAdapt, uh, there were many communication activities uh, for raising awareness about uh, the risks uh, and uh, the way to deal with the climate change uh, adapting. So, uh, as, as you may know, all life projects uh, uh, have uh, uh, one part dealing with dissemination and communication. And uh, I think uh, uh, both uh, the, the Derris uh, and uh, the Green for Grey have done uh, a really great job uh, in, in involving the local communities, uh, either uh, through participatory processes uh, involving them in designing, for example, uh, the, the Green for Grey uh, with universities and students uh, that uh, actually design some of the, of the, the measures. 
And so, yeah, th these two were very active in this sense. Yeah, you're muted, okay. Grazie, Lorenzo. Now, uh, let's go for Mar. Um, uh, you are asked about uh, if, if in Sevilla or Barcelona, uh, you had somehow uh, indicators to measure uh, social resilience advances. Thank you very much for this question. Um, in this case, we were just evaluating the processes. So which kind of stakeholders were engaged in the processes and, and which degree of public influence um, were, were having these, these stakeholders. Um, but for, for the same project, we, for instance, have been evaluating the social vulnerability, um, how these plants approach social and environmental vulnerability and whether these plants are dealing with um, the, um, the needs of the communities more, more vulnerable. So we don't have specifically created um, indicators for social resilience, but we are analyzing all these um, different items that are related to social resilience. Many thanks, Mar. It's not is not uh, an, 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 uh, a simple question. So I think I think there is a lot of work to do, as we were talking before about how to tackle mess impact or or measuring environment and social um, uh, benefits of some of our solutions. Is the same with the with the social um, analysis. I remember during our work in, in, in City Resilience Global Program uh, in the tool, in City Resilience Profiling Tool, one of the, of the most difficult challenges uh, was precisely to find some uh, way of measuring social and, and, and everything that had to do with the municipal public services. Uh, so yeah, it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I have uh, another question for Mariana Marmelada because your, your um, proposal was very honest, showing that some of the, of the, of the solutions uh, after all these uh, participatory process didn't get. Uh, uh, so I, I would like to know from you, after your experience, uh, how do you see the tactic to get all these strategies and make them real for the future? Thank you for the question. Uh, not, easy, not easy question, I know. <laughs> no. uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that, um, well, the involvement of other stakeholders and other like third parties interesting in the, in, the, in the recovery process should be involved in the process instead of just being the government and the population. Because one of the things that uh, we actually saw was that if the government doesn't hear the population and just decides uh, what to do in the recovery process. Most of the times the acceptance rates of the projects are not very high and the community feels that it's not being listened to and it's so it doesn't have a sense of belonging to the place. So this was actually a scene, uh, especially in 2014, where the land, oh, there was another landslides and floods uh, incident in Japan, actually in Hiroshima as well and uh, a rural uh, community was actually moved into an urban settlement. So they lost all types of uh, social boundary and their, their own community sense of belonging. And so their actual home place was uh, flooded and it was, uh, what was converted into um, a dam. So now it's submerged under the water. And, and another situation where um, the government actually listened to the community but listened i believe in at least in my opinion in a really early stage was during the the um, the tsunami incident so the population that was affected in japan they were listened to at a very early stage so their trauma was very heightened and so all the solutions that they asked was uh, huge walls that would seal everything and that it would protect them from the sea and this actually destroyed the identity of the place. So I think there should be many uh, stakeholders and many people interested in this kind of solution, especially 
uh, specialists in the area such as uh, natural based solutions and architects and urban planners more involved in this uh, this process instead of just being two ways obviously they are doing what, what they can and it's it's already amazing that they are involving and listening to the community but i think other options since for example in this case they asked for for um, okay we are university students so obviously we're not specialists uh, but since they asked for a more utopian project or something to be presented to them maybe there should to, should have been a better link between us and the community so there the solutions would be a bit more feasible and at least more um, enjoyable for the community i believe thank you Many thanks, Mariana. I will ask uh, a couple of questions more uh, for Muji. Um, we need to know about, because you are uh, getting more and more communities involved in these kind of projects. So how do you see, uh, how, do you, how are you going to use the economy of scale to, to go for, for different or, or bigger business plans uh, within all your, your uh, strategy, if you have uh, this in, in mind? is um, make uh, the bottom-up process uh, with the top-down process. Uh, the top-down is like the policy from the uh, from the region of Bogor Agency, uh, like um, instruction to the head of districts to make some movements and. Uh, it's like a proud of a head of district if their communities are uh, uh, success in awardings. So uh, it's kind of top down process, but in bottom up process, it's like we really uh, um, uh, educate and motivate the community within the facilitators that comes intensive. Uh, but also in this COVID pandemic, it's um, everything is different. So um, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, in a you know, next year, if everything is better, I we we will do the 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 strategy that like uh, we have forty districts and uh, like. All of our two districts has already uh, their representatives of community, and it's it's um, more and more uh, so that it's something like snowballing. So it's like snowballing, it's like a proud of the community to do the the environmental movement, something like that already in this um, region. Okay, many thanks, Muji. Um, another question from the audience, uh, because I see that we have uh, a bit more time uh, for Mar. Um, uh, so apart from, from giving you thanks, you, uh, the audience have give, given you, uh, to all of you thanks, but now it's written here. Uh, someone is interested in, in the theories you use to determine which groups uh, would make the inclusive categories. So did you come across climate justice theory? Thank you very much for the question. Um, we didn't we didn't use a rigid definition, but a definition. So we 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 used the what uh, the categories mentioned by the plant itself. So so not using the uh, a pre-established definition, but when the plants were saying that they were targeting a specific group such as um, elders, such as um, neighborhoods with with low socioeconomic uh, status, etc., um, we were we were adding them um, in this in this category. As I said, we couldn't find many plants um, addressing this population or these vulnerable groups. Um, in the um, design and implementation. That doesn't mean that the plan is mentioning them. It means that the plan is not engaging them either in the design of the plan, so in the process of creation, or in the implementation of the plan. 
And as I said, two of the plants that were um, addressing this population were precisely the heat waves and the droughts plan um, that, that were uh, saying that in the uh, implementation phase, they had to target these specific groups in order to ensure um, that the plan was, was known by these, these groups that were very vulnerable to heat waves and, and, and in this case, with droughts. Okay, thanks. I will link this with my last question for, for Mariana, my last individual question. And it's precisely, you have been explaining uh, these projects with women. Uh, do you have, uh, and, and I know, because I know uh, Teresina situation that uh, there are a lot of people in vulnerable situations. So do you have any other project or any other um, foreseen strategy that you see uh, working with vulnerable, with people in vulnerable situations, and, and what's that, if, if there is any? Obrigada. Sure, uh, we have um, a very broad strategy in Teresina because we recognize that we have an overlapping of uh, several vulnerabilities, not only the environmental, but also socioeconomic. So, one of the main projects that we have now that is being implemented is the CRGP, the City Resilience Global Program uh, by UN Habitat Barcelona, the, the hub in Barcelona. And we are, um, we are in the implementation step and it, it's going to give us a better overview of all the vulnerabilities that we have the, the shocks and stresses that we are uh, vulnerable to. So I think this is the main strategy that we have now, but all the proposals that we are uh, making with the different partners uh, inside the municipality of Teresina is somehow covering the, the climate change topic and also uh, assuming that people under vulnerability uh, in vulnerable situation, they are more also they gonna suffer um, the the worst of this climate change, the the local impacts of climate change. So we put people first in all the all the projects, and uh, the the first step in the consolidation of this strategy was to know better where we we work, where uh, we started. So we started monitoring the indicators and to, to have this partnership with UN Habitat is gonna be great because it's gonna give us a lot of information what is a good basis to start other projects like that. Because when we started Women for Climate, we already knew about uh, how those women were gonna be impacted by climate change. So information is a key. Um, <clears throat> Obrigada, Mariana. I, I will finish because I think we are quite fine with time. Just five minutes late. Um, I, I, I will finish with, uh, with just a thought about uh, COVID because all of the projects we have uh, seen today uh, are about, um, are about um, community engagement and nature-based solutions. And in the community engagement, we have a specific uh, issue now with the COVID. Um, I can I, I can think in, in 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 all our projects have some delayed or or as for instance Lorenzo is proposing uh, some of these projects in in live projects they have to go to virtual or they have seen to higher use of social media as you are. So this um, conference is one example because uh, at the very beginning was not planned this way, uh, but finally we have uh, we have got it. So so somehow uh, we are um, resilient, <laughs> and uh, and this is uh, the I think the the, the positive uh, thought I want to finish with uh, because situations are quite difficult out out there. Uh, for environment, for uh, socioeconomic recovery, and for people. 
and uh, and okay we should work for for uh, for the better so thanks to all of the participants great um, presentations and see you soon and thanks to all the attendees that were there bye thanks bye 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 thanks a lot bye many thanks <laughs>